it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my February wrap up. I read quite a few books in February and it was a roller coaster of highs and lows so I'm here and ready to talk about all of those books with you. I'll have content warnings in the description box below if that's something you need but without further ado let's get right down to the books. So I decided we're just going to start out there with... <laughs> I've been avoiding reviewing this book and that is Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall. Alexis Hall used to be, or still is kind of, my favourite romance writer and first of all I'm just going to review this book like it's any other romance book because I did really enjoy this book. So Boyfriend Material follows Luke and he is a bit of a disaster, his life is a bit of a mess. He's got a very famous father and he always ends up in the tabloids for the wrong reasons and his company basically say that you are going to be fired unless you can be caught in the tabloids with someone a bit more respectable for once. So he ends up fake dating this lawyer who he doesn't quite get along with so that he can be dating someone who's respectable and that is what Boyfriend Material is all about. It's a very cute romance, I really really liked it. I tend to struggle a little bit with Alexis Hall's main characters, I feel like they're quite often unlikable and they go on a journey to become more likeable throughout the book but I never really felt for Luke. However, Oliver Blackwood should be protected at all costs. He was so sweet and so genuine and he's always trying to do the right thing even if sometimes the right thing is ultimately not what he wants to do or not what will make him happy and it was like quite nice to see like, a character like that. I feel like sometimes I can be a bit like that so it was just nice reading about Oliver Blackwood. My favourite thing about this book were the jokes between Luke, our main character, and a uh, secondary character, I think his name is Alex. I just found that so hilarious and funny. So definitely times when this book made me smile and laugh. The secondary characters are so well fleshed out. I do have some things that I didn't quite like. I feel like Luke's mother sounded like a robot. All of her dialogue just felt completely unbelievable to me. But at the same time, I quite liked seeing an adult character. And I think Alexis Hall does this well across all of his books, or mostly all of them, where you're an adult character, but when you have issues or when you have problems, you still go back to your parents and spend time with your parents and talk to them and ask their advice. That was also really nice to see. Another thing that I didn't quite like was the representation of vegetarianism, which is just such a really weird thing to say, but honestly, they acted like Oliver being a vegetarian in this book was the end of the world and so difficult to cater to when really that's not the case. So I was just a bit like, why are you just dissing on vegetarianism so much in this book? And there is a paragraph where the Muslim community has talked about it not being the best paragraph. So that is in there too, just so you know. But overall, I had a really good time with Boyfriend Material. It was sweet and it was cute and it was lovely. Second review for this book. I'm going to review it now like it's an Alexis Hall book. And if, <laughs> as an Alexis Hall book, what on earth was this? I'm so, I'm sorry, sorry. This, this is his first traditionally published romance book that I've read. I've read his books when they're indie romance published and it was like someone just poured a bucket of water over Alexis's Hall's writing style. I can just tell because it didn't have as much of that beautiful literary style that I really like across all of his indie romance where it feels so literary but at the same time it felt so accessible as a romance and in this one his writing style just felt a whole load more commercial romance fiction and I really just felt like someone had taken all of the things that I really loved and admired about Alexis Hall's writing style and just really just toned it down to the max and it made me so sad to see that because that was one of the reasons why he was my favourite romance writer. Not to say that the writing style is bad or anything, it just does not hold a candle to the rest of his indie published romance books. Another thing that I really like when I read Alexis Hall's romance books, and I'm glad I'm saying this because I forgot to mention it in my like proper review of it, is that my favourite thing about Alexis Hall's romance is the sex scenes. I think he writes incredibly good sex scenes and the way he describes certain body parts and certain actions it reads like poetry often. So when I read this book and <laughs> you don't get into the sex scene very fast, it's like 200 pages in or something, I was like wow you know Alexis Hall's never made me wait that long but also 
it's fade to black. So if you're someone who doesn't want any, you know, steamy scenes on page, this is the Alexis Hall romance book for you. But as someone who looks forward to and anticipates his sex scenes because they are so well written and are literally my favourite sex scenes that you can find in any romance book that's published, I was so, so angry and so disappointed that it was Fade to Black in this book. I don't know if it's got something to do with it being traditionally published and catering towards an audience that is more likely to read it in commercial fiction or not. I don't know, I can't say because I haven't read his other traditionally published romance books, but just for me it was just a huge disappointment because it's not what I expect with Alexis Hall because he's never done that before and it just... It basically stripped away the two favourite things that I like about Alexis Hall books, which are the sex scenes and the writing style. So I was just left with a normal romance book that's not top tier, which is still really good, but it just... A book can be really good and still disappoint you, and that's where I'm at with boyfriend material. I hope that review was candid. I am recommending it as a romance book to people who probably have never read it before or just really like his books and are not, those aren't the reasons why you love his books. So that difficult review aside, I also read Laura Olympus by Rachel Smith, and this is a graphic novel, kind of more modern take retelling of Hades and Persephone and this is the first volume of what I believe is three so it's very much the story coming together and just starting out and boy did I really enjoy this one. I think I read it at just the perfect time where I needed something that was calming, that was lovely, that was absolutely beautiful and this book served that to me and more. What I really really loved about this book was Persephone as a character, she's quite young, she's quite naive and though she's sweet and such a cinnamon roll she's still got a bit of that sassy jokey element to her, she kind of knows what she wants to be and she's just trying to work towards it and it was just so nice to follow her character, it was so lovely. Hades on the other hand I didn't particularly care for in this one, there is a bit of an age gap so if that's not your thing then maybe this isn't one for you but Hades to me he was fine, he didn't come across as creepy or anything, he just you know, he was there, he was Hades. The artwork is absolutely stunning. I'll try and put some photos in of my favourite panels. I just was reading this and the colour palette and the artwork did it for me. I just thought it was absolutely gorgeous. I also really, really like the secondary characters and how they interacted with our main characters. Artemis was just such a great girl best friend and I really liked Eros as well, he was just fantastic. So I had a good time with the friendships that are also in the book. I really liked how all of the female characters do talk about the way that the male characters are all so sex driven and have some elements of toxic masculinity. None of them put up with it, none of the female characters and that was quite nice to see. And the other thing that I really really liked about this book was I feel like in most retellings of the Greek mythology they've got Zeus, Hades and Poseidon as like enemies or slightly competitive which is what the myths kind of imply but I kind of like that they just put them together as amicable brothers here. It's not like there's another series I absolutely adore where there are three brothers who struggle to get along but still have that really loving brotherly bond underneath it all. Not like that at all but again I really enjoyed seeing three brothers just kind of be messy, kind of be funny but still love each other all the way through this book. So this was a really good start to the series. I can't wait to read the second volume and I can very much see why this is such a beloved webtoon. <laughs> We're about to get into it with this book. <laughs> I read Truth Witch by Susan Dennard. Absolutely hated it. Well, this book was awful. It was so bad. So in this book, we follow these two best friends. One of them is a truth witch, which is incredibly rare. And she can tell when someone is telling her the truth or when someone is lying. And she's friends with this Fred witch and something happens where her secret kind of ends up coming out that she's a truth witch and now everybody wants to take advantage of her and there's this whole thing brewing within this world. <laughs> it was so bad. Okay, so all of the world building is absolutely non-existent. Nothing gets explained to you, but while nothing is getting explained to you, the book is on the go, the action is pumping and everything's happening. And because there are no rules really set, 
nothing makes sense. She's a truth witch, but the amount of times characters lie to her and she doesn't recognize that they're lying to her is so annoying because it's like, what is the point of her if she's supposed to be a truth witch and this is supposed to be such a valuable skill, but he's, she still never knows if people are lying or not frustrated me and then her friend who's a thread witch got really annoying from her point of view because she's always like it, it leaned a lot into tell instead of show because with a thread witch you can see people's emotions and so she was always like I could see that they were sad I could see that they were this but then rather than showing me that in their actions it was just telling me what their emotions were and it was so annoying to constantly have that almost every time she looked at someone and as well as that this character seemed to be able to tell the truth more than the truth witch because she could see when people's threads were honest while they were talking and it just made it a bit wishy-washy as to which skills were directed to which person don't get me started on different inconsistencies that were in this book there was this salamander cloak that's made from salamander skin and if you're wearing it then a certain it was almost like the tracker from um twilight this type of witch where it can like smell your blood a blood witch and then they would like track you if you're wearing that cloak, he can't track you. <laughs> I was just like, what? That's such a, uh, a cop-out. That's such an easy solution. Why don't they always wear these clothes? And then it turns out you don't even have to wear the cloak. You could just drape the room in the walls of that cloak and stay in that space or wear the cloak when you go out and then they would never be able to track you. So that was like a big plot hole in the middle of this plot. I just don't understand why the plot was happening the way it was happening. There were other inconsistencies such as, for example, they're on a ship and between these two ships, a battle is happening and the wind witches who have the power to like jump, like fly through the wind or whatever and control the wind, have to fly between the ships to access them because they're ships, they're not linked together, they're in a battle. And then somehow, all of these characters who aren't wind witches are suddenly on the other ship there were so many more inconsistencies like that and it was just getting incredibly frustrating i didn't like any of the characters i didn't really feel for them because it was so poorly written and even though the beginning of the book had so much action going for it and so much happening that at least it was a breeze to read through i hit the halfway mark and it slowed down enormously the romance got very annoying, it was obvious where it was going to go from the start and then it was just kind of forced down your throat. I just really struggled to think about what I liked when it came to this book and it's so popular that I was hoping and anticipating it getting better at some point and it just never ever got there, it never ever got better and so I just know I unfortunately will not be continuing with this series. I don't think I even listed all the things that I didn't like about it but I have to say thank you to Hannah from Hannah Reads Way Too Much for buddy reading this with me and keeping up with my very mood readery slow pace. Thanks for ranting about this book with me. We had some good banter. We had some fun. Then I read another fantasy book. We're just gonna go through my fantasy reads right now. And that was Serial by Garth Nix. This was a book I originally started once and it was a buddy read and then my buddy reader DNF'd it. And then I also put it on pause for a while, but I finally picked it up and finished it. We follow Serial, who is the main character and her father goes missing and he is the one who's like a necromancer. He works magic that has to do with the dead and spirits and she's training in this and learning this. When her father goes missing, she goes on an adventure and quest to find him. And that's what this book is about. And overall, I think it was fine. I really struggled with the first third of it and that's where I originally put it on pause because it was quite boring to me. It was quite slow paced. And it was one of those books where the character is traveling for a very long time and just traveling along a journey. You know those travel fantasy books, they're not my style. I tend to find them very boring and this one fell into that category. But if you like that kind of thing or can push through it a bit more, then you might like this one more than me. I didn't really connect to any of the characters. I thought they were all just mediocre. There's like this magic spirit cat thing. So if you like cats in books, maybe you'll like this more than me as well. I usually like cats in books, but this one just didn't do it for me. Even though it was like a demon spirit cat still, you know, 
Margaret Rogerson did it better. At some point, I think the last third, all of the action comes to a boil and everything's happening very fast. And that was actually good. I quite liked the ending. I thought it was entertaining. I was suddenly turning the pages faster and actually interested in what was gonna happen. So the ending was very, very good. And that sometimes makes me wonder if the second book is gonna be a good one to read. And I did it about whether I should continue or not, but I just think there's too many fantasy series that I do want to read. And so unfortunately, I'm not gonna be reading further in this series. It was fine. I don't have any strong dislikes or likes with this book. It was just something that I read. I'm so in the mood to dig into a fantasy, but they're all kind of falling short for me. So I kept trying. I read A Psalm of Storm and Silence by Roseanne A. Brown. This is the sequel to A Song of Wraiths and Ruin. So I won't really be giving you a synopsis of this book, but just know it's the second book and the end of the series as the series is a duology. And I thought the first book was over Okay, I've actually got a reading vlog where I read this, so I'll link that down below. And I thought the first one was okay, but then the ending of the first book was absolutely amazing and the author just went places that I typically don't see authors going and I was so impressed that she dared to do the thing and that she did it well and the ending just left me in a place where I was so sure I was going to read the sequel. However, the sequel was just a bit disappointing. I liked it even less than the first book. I think it really struggled from just repeating the same narrative, but in a slightly different way. So the plot kind of felt a bit repetitive. There was also something going on with a demon character. And again, I think Margaret Rogerson did the demon thing better because the demon storyline just fizzled into nothing and nowhere and the ending was so easy and such a cop out. Even the big grand finale of the whole series just felt a bit too easy, a bit too easily solved. There were like no major deaths, there was no real emotion or high stakes for me. So I was a bit disappointed in the ending. Overall, the book was fine. One of the characters, one of the points of view end up having a bit of a travel narrative, which I've already mentioned is not my favorite thing. The other one had very good character development and was a bit more interesting, but it was quite predictable where the story was gonna go. And yeah, in the end, I just felt like this was fine, but I just really shouldn't have picked up the second book. I should have just finished with the first one. So that was that. Thank you to Victoria from what Victoria read for buddy reading with me. It was good because you pushed me to finish a series probably sooner than I would have by myself. After that, I read Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. And this was for my journey of reading the oldest books on my TBR. I think most people know what this book is about. It's a travel memoir where this character is going through a really tough time and she decides to get rid of all of her possessions and just leave all of her money and go on a whole year long travel trip. She goes to three different countries and in these three countries, one of them the focus is eating, one of them the focus is praying and the other one the focus is love. I think this travel memoir, I'm gonna just defend it. <laughs> this is the hill I will die on. So this travel memoir gets a lot of critique for it being a white woman, you know, who's very privileged, has enough money to do this, just leaving everything and then going to all of these different countries and then just feeling better and good about herself at the end of it. And I would say that this book is not that. I think people tend to oversimplify this book and judge it without having read it from the sounds of that kind of, opinion that I hear a lot because in this one I really appreciated how at the beginning she quite she sets the scene for what is going on in her life and her divorce sounds actually absolutely awful and she talks about depression and how terrible she was feeling and the fact that she left all of her possessions and kind of lost all of her money to go on this trip it wasn't a choice really it was kind of because of that horrible divorce so then she goes on this trip and she goes through a process of self-discovery. And yes, people travel and have these self-discoveries and epiphanies, it does happen. I've been there, I've done that on my year abroad and on some of my travel trips too. It does happen while traveling sometimes. And it's not like this is her first time traveling. She's actually a well-experienced traveler who has been to many places. She's just doing another trip, basically. 
So I do think that this book gets a bad rep for no reason, but I actually really, really enjoyed reading this one. I thought Elizabeth Gilbert did a good job of being funny, but also being really serious when she needed to be and being self-reflective while also being respectful of other people's cultures and beliefs and the way that they live life. I love the way she talks about travel, the way she talks about language. She really takes the effort to learn the languages of the places she's going and the way she truly immerses herself in these cultures. Because yes, while she is traveling in this book, because she stays there for such a long period of time, it's also a bit like she's living there and truly getting to experience it and not just the touristy side of things, which I really appreciated seeing, but the way she talked about travel and culture and language and the people and looking at their mindsets and how she can adapt them to fit into her own life is some of the things that I really like about traveling, which I've definitely missed over these past two years with the COVID pandemic. So came out of this book with a lot of wanderlust, but I also found it so interesting to hear some of her thoughts on spiritualism and the way that she manages her belief system, which is completely different from mine, but I always appreciate just seeing how other people have their faith and their beliefs. And it was just really interesting to put that into practice. I will say that she's got some pretty strong opinions on medication in terms of mental health, but she is talking about herself. So take that with a pinch of salt and don't take it as advice for you. You do what's best for you really well written i actually raced through this one i just wanted to keep reading and i think i'm going to treasure this book so that was a very pleasant surprise i read recitative by tony morrison and this is her never before published short story and i will say that if you are buying this book the first half of this book because it's 80 pages long the first like 40 pages is all introduction by Zadie Smith so just be aware that the short story is actually only 40 pages long and not as long as this small book already is but give Toni Morrison 40 pages and she will tell you a story I did not think that 40 pages she could give me so much depth but she really does. So in this one, we're following these two characters who end up in a support system as children because their parents are unable to care for them, or their mothers, I should say, are unable to care for them. One of the children is black, one of the children is white. Then it kind of spans their life as they come apart and meet at different occasions. And it really talks about ableism. It talks about racism. It talks about... Um, discrimination I guess but it also just talks about their relationships to their mothers their relationships to each other and also a lot about memory how memory works how memory fails us sometimes and how memory can really impact what we do today and those are quite a lot of themes to fit into a 40 page book but Morrison absolutely nailed it I will always love Morrison's writing style it was just an easy read on a nice Saturday morning the ending is kind of closed in a way, but it's still open enough to let you think about things and mull over it for a bit. I just thought this was a fantastic short story and I just don't know how Toni Morrison manages to pull it off every single time. But yeah, I really recommend this short story. I also read Miss Death, Mrs. Death by Selena Godden and unfortunately this was a bit of a disappointment for me. In this one, we're following Wolf, who is this character who lives kind of in this like rundown, flat in London he's quite poor and he's just trying to get by and he has an encounter with Miss Death when he was younger and it's a portrayal of death that we don't usually see. People think that death is a grim reaper or like this other image but in this book Miss Death is an old homeless black woman and Wolf kind of meets Miss Death and starts writing her story. This one is told in a mix of prose and poetry, quite a lot of poetry, it leans into that quite a bit and I didn't really know that before going in so it's a bit of a surprise and it just didn't really work for me. I feel like it was a bit too random, it was a bit too strung together and it didn't just all click and fall into place in the way that I would like my poetic prose reads to do so. It just felt too stringy, too random, a bit too unconnected for my liking. I don't really have anything bad about it to say but it just wasn't my cup of tea and I think if you like things that are slightly strange, slightly whimsical and you like poetry it could be something for you but it just wasn't one for me. 
I then read The Princess and the Fangirl by Ashley Poston. So if you watch my January wrap up, you'll know that I read Geekerella and absolutely fell in love with it. And so I read this second book. And again, I can't really give it five stars because it's not the perfect book, but it's still a new favorite in my heart because I adore this series. So The Princess and the Fangirl is a retelling of The Princess and the Frog. It's again set at a con and it's all around the con. It's really entirely based there this time. And in this world, there is this TV series that has a really big fandom around it, but the TV series is a bit old and a film remake has been made, which was made in the first book. And we were following the actor from that and a Cinderella kind of character. But in this one, the film is done and there are hints of a sequel and we're following the female lead who was in the film remake and she doesn't want there to be a sequel. She doesn't want this big blockbuster film to be the kind of avenue that she's pushed into for her career. She wants to do more artistic and Oscar worthy films. So she's really hoping that there's an announcement that there won't be a sequel, but everybody wants there to be a sequel. Then we're also following a female main character who is just at the con. She loves this remake and she really wants there to be a sequel and she really wants the female character to have a very certain role in this and she's like advocating for it and she's got like a petition and everything and then something goes wrong and the female actress could be blamed for this. So what she needs to do is step out of the limelight for a bit so she can sneak around the con and find what she needs to find to prove her innocence. And that's where the other female lead comes in because she looks quite a lot like this actress. So they end up switching places so that they can both achieve what they want to achieve. It was so good. I have to say, at first, Jess, who is the female actress, came across as so unlikable. I was like, is this the same character that I met in the first book? But you kind of see why she is that way. And I really, really appreciated the discussions on what it's like to be a female actress in the industry, some of the highs, but also a lot of the lows in terms of sexual assault sometimes, in terms of the comments on appearance you get and also the certain roles that are available to you. So it was nice to see some of that discussion in this one and it really being a focus of the story. I also really like how it showed when you've got different perspectives on things, sometimes you can really misjudge people and not understand them because you're too busy projecting your own opinion of what they must be like onto them. And it was just nice to see both of the main characters kind of work through that, unpick that and process that. And I really liked that element of the story. I love the fandom. This fandom doesn't even exist, but I'm still a fangirl of the fandom, if that makes sense. While also being a fangirl for the book, it's so nice to have that double fangirlness. But yeah, the fandom is just so well created and it feels like world building, even though this is a young adult contemporary and it's just done incredibly well that I've also fallen in love with the fandom. I expected, because we have an LGBT plus romance in here and a LGBT plus identifying character, I expected the romance to just go a certain way and to, for it to be between two people even before I started the book. And the book managed to surprise me. That was not the couple that ended up getting together. I was fine with it because I liked the matches that they had. So yeah. It was pleasantly surprising in some ways. In other ways, it was incredibly predictable. I already knew the outcome of the mystery right from near the beginning. And there was also a major clue that was a bit too major, but all in all, very, very good. So much fun. I adore these young talk contemporary books. And I feel like I'm procrastinating reading the third one because there is absolutely no more after this. And I'll be very sad when there's no more for me to read. I then read Strange Planet by Nathan W. Pyle. And this is a like compilation of those memes that you find on Instagram, where it's like these aliens come down to earth and they're living in earth and they describe everything very weirdly. I thought this was fine. I read quite a few of these memes because I've seen them on Instagram before. So there are some like double ups in this. It was a really nice way to just spend a late night when I was just wanting to read something for a quick half an hour. It was fun, it was good, but I don't think it's anything memorable. Just a good time, but I think I prefer them as like random Instagram posts that I come across every now and again, rather than reading them back to back. We've come to my only five star read this month and I absolutely loved it. And that was Messy Roots by Laura Gao. And this is a graphic memoir of a Wuhanese American. And basically that's what it is. We're just following this Wuhanese American woman's life and it was just so nice 
to read because Laura Gao is 23 so she's the same age as me and she's a first generation immigrant whereas I am second generation so not quite the same but we've both got those elements of being international kids of having a cultural background where you identify with and you come from you don't always fit in when you go over there and then you're living somewhere else and you don't necessarily always fit in in the exact ways that you want where you're from and it's got that just international child vibe that I could really relate to and it's also got some of the markers of being an international child that like I think becomes part of the culture of being an international child if that makes sense so it was nice to see like the games that I used to play being mentioned and like some of the songs that used to be popular at the same age as when she was talking about them just having that nostalgia vibe so this book already had a nostalgia vibe even though I'd never read it before I also really liked how I played basketball and I also played basketball so it's kind of nice to see those connections basically I was just connecting to this personally so much even though she's from an entirely different cultural background than me that said, I think it did a very good job of talking about things that I can't relate to, which is having a language barrier when it comes to communicating with some of your family. Also, some of the discrimination she faces is different from the discrimination that I have faced or black people face. So it was just interesting to see it from her perspective. It does talk a little bit about what it's like to be Wuhanese during the COVID pandemic beginning and feeling safe or not feeling safe in certain places, what it's like to go home after or after the whole COVID pandemic has been kicked off and things like that. So it does touch on really important things. And even though I'd been aware, of course, of the discrimination that a lot of Chinese and even just Asian people faced after the COVID pandemic kicked off, I didn't acknowledge or realize that there was also discrimination within China against people from Wuhan so this like opened my eyes to that quite a bit. Laura is also a uh, lesbian so you get to see some of her experience being a person of color and coming out and all of that as well so there was that side to the story which was nice to see. It was just so nice to just see her going through her life and experiencing the cultural steps or figuring out her identity that she does. I think the artwork wasn't my favourite artwork ever but I think it did a good job of representing the story that it's talking about and making me smile sometimes and making me laugh. I read this is a proof of this so unfortunately mine's not full colour all the way through so I can't tell you about the colour palette but I looked at some photos online and it just this was such a really good graphic novel memoir I just I recommend it. I then read Grown a celebration of black British girlhood that will empower a generation by Melissa Cummings Quarry and Natalie A Carter so this one is one of those books that you give to teenagers as they're growing up like remember those books like what's happening to my body and it just explains about periods and menstruation and everything and there's also one for boys well, Grown is one for black teenagers, black female teenagers, I should say. And even though it says black British girlhood on the cover, I actually think that this is good for just black teenagers worldwide. I really, I really, I really like this. It's not only just talking about what's happening with your body, even though it does talk about, you know, growing breasts and periods and everything like that but it also goes into just so much more it touches on what it's like to be a black teenager it touches on skincare that's particularly for black skin it discusses subjects like bleaching it discusses how to care for your hair and different styles that you can do it also talks about empowerment and just black female figures that you can look up to it gives lists and recommendations of music to try and books to read and tv series and films to watch which are black directed and it's got black casts in them and black authors. It was just such a nice celebration of black girlhood. It also talks about things that are very important like sexual assault and how to handle those uncomfortable things. It touches on faith and religion and what it means to figure out your own religion when you're either someone who's grown up in a religion or doesn't have one whatsoever, but it does so in a very respectful way. And while we've got these two authors who are the main ones writing this story, I think they did a very good job of bringing in guest speakers to talk about subjects and elements that they can't fill so for example if like I don't remember exactly but if these two 
um, authors are both Christians. When it comes to the faith chapter, they bring in someone who's Muslim, they bring in someone who's queer and also religious, or people who struggle with religion and people who are really for it. So I feel like it was not an overly biased representation of any subject in this. It just really balances it. it talks about finances, money, safety, just anything you can need growing up and I just truly appreciated that. It's got lovely illustrations throughout, it's got some spaces for exercises where you can fill in answers. What more can I say to convince black parents to get these for your black teens growing up? I did a lot of reading last month and then last but not least I read The Reactor by Nick Blackburn which is a book about grief and repair. It's quite a memoir feeling kind of book. It's Nick Blackburn talking about his experience with his father's death and passing but also looking at the ways in which grief is represented in the world around us with a particular focus on the Chernobyl disaster. And this is one of my anticipated reads for January because it's a memoir, it's about grief, that's all like all the kind of things I like, but I was a bit disappointed in this. I think that has to do with the writing style. It's told in these little snippets, which at first I really liked because I think it did a good job of showing how grief is such a fragmented emotion and thing to go through and you feel very broken up. But at the same time, I don't think it gave me enough substance for me to really hold on to and really dig deep, didn't give me enough substance because we were getting them in such small choppy parts and sometimes the comparisons about grief and repair within the world felt a little bit randomly selected. I think if it had just been narrowed down to the focus of Nick's own experience and the Chernobyl disasters and those kind of comparisons and parallels, it could have been a better book rather than bringing it in and opening it to everything. That said, when Nick Blackburn was talking about his own experiences, I do think that was very emotional and very moving and such a valid experience you just can't deny or argue with any of those. So those are the parts that move me the most. But overall, in the end, this book was just fine for me and not one I loved, but not one I disliked either. And there you have it. Those are all of the books that I've read in the month of February. I'm surprised I read so much more than January because it's a shorter month, but that's life, I guess. Please let me know in the comment section down below what was your favourite recent read. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. And don't forget, hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video. And you know what they say. Onwards and upwards. Excelsior!